Did you watch any of the football? Um, yes and no. I watched because I wanted to watch Shirley Ralph and Babyface perform. Babyface was watched. on too? See, look, I didn't even know he was there. I was watching uh, The Last of Us last night, catching up on that and shrinking yeah. and a bunch. Yeah, I just caught up on all my TV last night. And I wanted beautiful. to watch Rihanna perform. And, you know, I'm I'm still football. You know, I told you before, I grew up a fan, but Colin Kaepernick, how he's been treated, you know, the whole issue of CTE and concussions and how the players are treated post their retirements. It's, it's, it's a lot of problems there, you know, that, that, All right. that, and then the lack of black coaches. I mean, the team that won Kansas city, you know, um, listen, the offensive coordinator, F Eric B B uh, the co head coach admitted that this black man really won the game for them. He can't get a job. You know, we still can't get black coaches in the league. And so there's so many problems there with the NFL so it's hard for me to watch it without a political lens because, you know, it's just real like that. And I mean, did I pay attention to the game? No, I mean, and I'm a person who used to throw Super Bowl parties. I used to have big Super Bowl parties, but that's just not happening anymore because it's just it's just too many problems with the sport and 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 the the, the, the unwillingness. Like sport, fit football is almost like a metaphor for America. It's like, you know, unwillingness to – you can be here, but we're not really trying to share power with you all at all. That's really what it's about. It's yes. Like, you know? And yet you gave them your algorithms. Yeah. Yeah. So how yeah. do we reconcile with that? I was just talking with Sam uh, Reynolds, uh, unlocking astrology before I came on today. We st st stayed back and chatted. And I said, you know, if there had to be a boycott for our, <laughs> for yeah. anything bus or otherwise, it wouldn't happen with this generation because we, 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 we make excuses for why we can't go the whole distance, right? So even in this conversation, for me, you know, maybe I'm extra. I am extra, so let me just admit that to the world. <laughs> I'm absolutely extra. That said, I feel like I can't, I can't halfway, I'm never going to be lukewarm about anything, mm. right? Mm. You're going to either, you're going to be on fire or it's going to be complete ice. But I'm like, I cannot tune in. Yep. And I feel like they're playing with us. Right. So last year it was Dr. Dre and Mary J. Blige. You know, you know, it's like, come on through Negroes, because they know we're the one of the biggest viewers, too. Right. It's not oh, yeah. just that 70 percent of the league is black. Black people support disproportionately this NFL and NBA and all sports. Right. Mm -hmm. Except for soccer. So I was like, if I tune into this, then they got me. Yeah. If I tune in just for the commercials, then they got me. They still got me. They still got what they wanted, which is my eyeballs, mm. my clicks, right? So I'm like, well, I can see Shirley Ralph. Somebody going to post it, and it's not going to be on. Make sure it wasn't on the NFL's thing. Somebody mm -hmm. else maybe took a picture at home. I'm like, you know, but it's 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 difficult, right, to to stand for something when you know you're literally. But then I think King, 68 percent of the of of the country, including black people, did not were not approving of what he was doing until after he got killed. You know, yeah, Malcolm, killed. Malcolm didn't have any. I mean, like, really, y'all, we, we immortalized people after we realized, oh, man, they really they really put it all on the line yeah. <laughs> for us. Yeah. yeah. You know, so it's 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 part of the course, but it's also frustrating because it's like, don't you see? They're just giving you someone said it's the blackest Super Bowl ever. I read that. That was in yes. USA Today, actually. Yes, they're, yeah. they're doing that because they understand we're not going to give you power. But here, Negroes, here's some chitlins. Y'all good with that. And, Make it and taste the, good. And, and the sad thing about it, you know, it reminds me of something that years ago, Karen, I interviewed Melvin Van Peebles and I asked him a simple question. I said, you were arguably the father of the black film movement, which some people call the black exploitation era of the 1970s, Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song, you know, and he was there in the thick of everything. He was a producer on Watt Stacks, that great documentary. He was winning Tony Awards with Broadway shows. He was in the middle of it. I said, why did that whole scene end? He said, basically, a couple of things. One, they were just they in quotes, we're just trying to appease black people because remember what we were coming out of the civil rights movement in the black power era. And so, okay, let's get some black movies. Let's get some black TV shows, et cetera. But he said, one of the things that black folks didn't realize, most of us didn't have the skill sets. And so when the plug was pulled, we couldn't continue on making anything because we hadn't bothered to develop any kind of plan of action that was separate of, you know, here's his, you know, we're going to just put this out there to make you feel good for a little bit, for a little while. And that's been the carrot on the stick for a long time. The same thing happened in the Harlem Renaissance because people forget 
Zorna Hurston and Langston Hughes were struggling by the time they got to the 30s. These are the That's two right. most famous writers of the Harlem Renaissance, but it was not easy. And Langston literally had to be driven around in a car to sell books out of the trunk of his car, just like we did in hip hop many years later. And we all know, if you just watch the documentary that's on, on PBS right now, Zorna Hurston, one of our greatest writers ever, great anthropologist, pioneer anthropologist, among any other things, ended up dying in an unmarked grave, you know, and it's just, and so we have to think about, you know, what does this look like for us? Are we just happy to be at the table or do you actually want to own the table? It's a big difference there. You wow. know what I mean? And you and I have been in this game a long time. So we know what it's like to get into stuff for free. You and I could have gone to Super Bowl for free yesterday. Ain't no, ain't, we know people. It ain't hard to do. We could have been, you know, we could have had the VIP badges. Man, I got, I mean, what do I need a VIP badge for now if I don't actually own the space that I'm in? You know what I mean? And and I think that's what we got to think about. And I think that we've had a lot of carrots on the stick with, with, with what's been happening and people getting caught up and, oh, so-and-so's here, so-and-so's there. But at the end of the day, what do we actually own? Because it's like the real power move would have been to say, OK, the way y'all treated Colin Kaepernick, you know, and, and other brothers, you know, Jerry, Jerry Jones, how he dis he threatened the Dallas Cowboy players. Literally, if y'all protest, this is what's going to happen. You know, it's to say, well, 70 percent of us are black and we're shutting this down. 80 percent of the NBA is black. We're shutting this down, you know, but that's the real power move. But it's like that takes courage. You know, that takes Muhammad Ali type courage. That takes Bill Russell type courage. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah, we're you know, not made like that. This, and sacrifice, not just courage, but sacrifice. Sacrifice, right? yeah. So, and, and the sacrifice is not what Bill Russell and Muhammad Ali sacrificed, which is their whole careers. Sacrifice is I'm not going to tune in. Yeah. That you don't even, like, I didn't miss it last night. And I, again, right. my Super Bowl parties probably were better than yours no, I'm just, <laughs> i doubt it i doubt it you know we're competitive <laughs> we're competitive we're competitive but yeah no right. i me too me too you know the mm -hmm. biggest screen tv yeah. all of the you know i even made you know some curry chicken and lasagna which is my my specialty mm -hmm. you know and then we just have people over i was you know bart bartender in a few a previous life so my drinks were tight you know but now nah, no more because either you stand for something or you fall for anything we've been falling for anything our lips should be tired of being busted from falling like i just enough already and at the end of the, the the day they are playing us like i'm like ah so let me ask you 866-801-8255 i'm really struggling with the black national anthem mm. being played i'm really struggling with this and, you know and i've had these conversations and my life has been changed uh dramatically uh talking every single saturday with dr gray Carr. but i'm gonna play i'm gonna play a clip from mm. him i'm gonna play a clip from him where he explains the difference between the stars. No, let me, let me do the first clip first. Uh, clip number two, this is from episode 46 in class with Carr. We were talking about James Weldon Johnson and lift every voice and sing. Play it, Steph. Along this way, the autobiography of James Weldon Johnson. This brother, uh, well, this is what James Weldon Johnson said when they said, well, you know, the Star Spangled Banner is an anthem and uh, lift your voice and sing as an anthem. He said, no, 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 huh. no. James Weldon Johnson, the author of the so-called Black National Anthem, said, when you hear the Star Spangled Banner with all that killing and all that, you know, blood, blood he said, it sounds like a drinking song. Now, remember, James Weldon Johnson was a poet. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He's badly written. It's like a drinking song. Lift your voice and sing. It's much more noble. That's a hymn. So when Jim, Jim Clyburn says that, uh, Jim Clyburn says, you know, let's make this the national hymn. You know what? This is how I might approach it if he and I, if I were talking to him. I said, I tell you what, uh, Congressman Clyburn, I will, I will, I will support that a hundred percent when you let all of us know two things. Number one, the difference between a hymn and an anthem. And I know you know it because you didn't say national anthem. You said national hymn. Number one, difference between a hymn and an anthem. And number two, whether or not we pray to the same God in the United States of America. Oh. Mm, okay. Mm. So bring in a hymn that was born out of understanding those second and third verses of the Star Spangled Banner that talked about the destruction, the annihilation of the enslaved, right? And serfs. And these brothers, James Weldon Johnson and his brother, crafting a hymn to empower black people around, it's literally a prayer 
Do you believe, Kevin Powell, that this song, which is sacred to us, and I feel the same way about Juneteenth, sacred to us, our experience born out of our trauma, our pain, should have been rammed into a celebration of gladiator games, CTEs, racism. Should it have been sung at the Super Bowl last night? No. And you know, it's interesting. Here's my theory now. I'm just going to put it out there for your audience. This is the first time I'm saying it aloud. I've been saying it to myself the last couple of days. We need to acknowledge that there's something now called in America, George Floyd hires Black folks who've been hired left and right, even if they weren't qualified for certain positions, usually diversity leadership positions. You know, uh, there's been the whole phenomenon of, of, of George Floyd maneuvers, which is what the Black National Anthem was just at the Super Bowl. And again, it's to appease Black folks, to make it look like, okay, we've learned our lesson from what happened to this Black man and Breonna Taylor and everybody else before that. You know, even as Tyree Nichols and other people are still getting killed, but this is to let us make you feel like you're actually you're part of the conversation, a part of the power sharing, which is really what it's about at this point. You know, not are we at the table? Are we sharing control of this table? And that's still the resistance. And so, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I'm happy to see Shirley Ralph individually get all these opportunities because she's been around for 40 plus years and she's a dynamic talent. And I'm happy to see her get all the accolades. You know, God bless her. I think that's a beautiful thing. But I do think that um, when you roll out okay, here's Shirley Ralph, you know, and here's Babyface doing America the Beautiful. And then you got Rihanna, you know, and I was happy for her, you know, and Rihanna has consciously, you know, we know supported a lot of black things, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Yes. And and yes. a lot of folks on the stage were her yesterday at the Super Bowl were black people. Most of those dancers were black people she was hiring. You know, she's very clear about what her vision is for this thing. But I think that, you know, I don't know, man, it's just, it's not an either or for me, but it always comes back to power. It comes back to power because at the end of the day, when I think about the Super Bowl now, I think about the money that's generated. I, you know, I think about the fact that, you know, not a single owner is black over this league that is 70% black bodies. And, and barely 1% of the coaches are black men, you know, and it, it, I want to put a pin in this for a second, y'all. The Philadelphia Eagles, their coach is a young cat, Nick Sirianni. He's a good coach. He's a young white brother. He's in his early 40s. Go look up his Wikipedia page. He literally made his way from from lower levels up and got an opportunity. Then what did he do when he became the coach of the Eagles? He hired a whole bunch of young white males to be uh, uh, coordinators with him. And so there's a kind of uh, a self-contained white male privilege thing that happens in the coaching ranks and the ownership ranks of the NFL, where it makes it almost impossible for someone who is not white male to get into these positions. And so that's why we're in the position that we're in. And, you know, even with DeMar Hamlin, as, as much I, I feel for what happened to him, I actually hope he doesn't go back to playing football ever again. And I think he has a greater purpose, a higher calling, which is to be a leader. I think he has an incredible voice and incredible story, but they'll take that and make that into something that everyone could rally around. But at the end of the day, I mean, the real issue is like, you know, well, is DeMar Hamlin ever going to be able to be an owner of a team in this league? Will he ever be, be, be able to be a head coach of this league? Or is he just going to be a symbol that we rally around, you know, uh, to make us feel good for the moment? You know, Buffalo strong, DeMar, we love DeMar Hamlin, you know, but do you love DeMar Hamlin if he starts speak, speaking out the way Colin Kaepernick spoke out? Then will you love in for him and that's the kind of stuff we need to be thinking about critically why don't we 866-801-8255 there are people right now squirming you know oh can you going too far you know it's just football it's just a game is it is it just a game no is it just a game no, and no, and and no. like really ask yourself why are they playing these games with us and we are absolutely coming to the table with our chips as if it's a fair it's a fair play it's not a fair board it's not a fair board they create the rules they change them at will they give you the piece that they want you to have and you play the game yeah why are we playing the game it's so frustrating so mm -hmm. yes you know and juneteenth shouldn't be a federal federal holiday it should not in my opinion it is it is ours and if it's going to be a federal holiday every white person in a country should be working but this is divisive right and and this is the first time I think I might agree with all of the the uh, the, the fragile tears of, of these folk that love Trump. They were so upset about this national <laughs> anthem, black national anthem, oh, they and they were, couldn't yeah. understand it. And people commenting on it, not even understanding the history of the original Star Spangled Banner of why James Weldon Johnson and his brother even made this. What is all about? They it's a lovely song, but I don't. I just think it's so divisive that we have two anthems. And they were like, "When does that happen?" I said, "Uh, Canada. You know, there are NBA teams in Canada. When the NBA plays Toronto, they play the Toronto national anthem, and they play uh, the." Uh, 
United States national anthem, and this country's divided. It's always been two countries. The Carter Report told us in the 60s, mm-hmm. America's two mm-hmm. countries, one black, one white. When has it ever been united? When has it ever come together? We need an either new constitution or we need to admit that this is a divided nation and stop with the bull crap of e pluribus unum because it's not out of many one. This is, this is something else going on here. And if you w- want to dispute it, please come with facts. 866-801-8255 because to me, it was both poignant and disturbing to have a national anthem, a, a black national hymn sung at the NFL's premier game, the Super Bowl, as well as a national anthem that defiled people who were formerly enslaved with his third verse. I'm like, it's the, it couldn't be more poignant and more fitting for people the, the state of this union. Up, 